Uh, shifting over on that, let's dig a little bit further into the vaccine front because we got that update from one of the leading uh, candidates here in Pfizer. Shares have been leading the Dow all day after that company came out, not just with the update on the vaccine front, but also uh, reporting earnings. The company beating expectations on its top line with revenue coming in at $11.8 billion. There's an 11% decline from last year, but Pfizer boosted its full year earnings outlook and gave that important update uh, on the vaccine candidate front with BioNTech, its, its partner in this. Uh, its vaccine candidate would be moving into its final trial stage. Uh, with about 30,000 patients in that trial. And importantly, the guidance does not include potential profits uh, from its vaccine candidates. So uh, joining us now for more on what this landscape looks like as we think about all these vaccine candidates and the potential case for profits to be made here. Uh, joining us now is Michael Lichten, UBS Managing Director, Equity Research. Uh, and, and Michael, when we talk about this, I, I just want to get your take on, uh, I guess, Right now, it seems like there's three major candidates here. We got the update from Moderna yesterday. Now Pfizer delivering their update. They're going to be approaching late stage trials. So how is this shaking out uh, in your mind? Yeah, thanks for having me on. And a uh, great segue from, from the prior speaker. I think what's very important to understand here is that so far we have phase one data for all the candidates. So we're, we're looking at some surrogate markers. We're making assumptions from what we believe the immunity does in humans uh, in response to these candidates. And then we try to extrapolate from that into whether we get protection or not. It's important to understand we have a fairly poor understanding of the natural immunity of this disease, um, which means the surrogates we're looking at here, antibodies or T cells, they're, they're pretty hard to interpret. So, so they're all sort of sitting there now with their phase one data. That's Astra and Oxford. Um, this is Pfizer, as you mentioned, and Moderna. And we're now waiting for the pivotal studies. We're waiting for results from the phase twos and phase threes. We should hopefully get some interim data later in the year. But the honest answer is, and that's what we wrote in our recent note, like we don't know until we know. We need to wait until we get that scientific exp experiment done. Um, at this point in time, I would argue that maybe Pfizer-BioNTech has a slight edge on the antibody side. Um, that data looks maybe a little bit more robust than, uh, than the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. um, but whether or not they work or don't work is really going to be a function of the clinical study. So your question about profitability is a good one. Um, we have a fairly strong statement from AstraZeneca. They will not make a profit on this as long as this is a pandemic. They've made that very, very clear. Um, Pfizer, BioNTech have clearly said they do want to make a profit out of this, and Moderna wants to make a profit out of this. J and J does not. So it's a bit, it's a little bit split. It's going to be interesting to watch how this pans out, um, given that some of these uh, shots that are available may be free. Yeah, how does that, how does that kind of change all this too? Because we have been watching that play out on, on kind of the cost front and how much that might actually hurt some of these uh, biotech companies, uh, I guess, ability to charge more for something like this in a pandemic, which obviously you wouldn't want to see because it's all about getting this out to people. Um, but still, that's on the table when we think about it. And Pfizer, importantly, has not taken uh, government money through Operation Warp Speed like we have seen uh, some of its competitors here. So how does that kind of change the dynamics? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think it's it's probably a function on who's been funded how initially. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised that um, AstraZeneca has just taken a view that as long as it is a pandemic because of the BARDA funding they have received, that it's, it's just wise to not uh, drive profitability. If this ends up being a, a seasonal vaccine further down the line, then, then fair enough that that may change. Uh, like, as you point out, Pfizer has, uh, has a different track. They've got the deal the other day um, for the, uh, the doses that they've committed to now for the U.S., and that works out as a, just shy of 20 bucks a, a shot, um, and, and they think that's going to make him a decent profitability. I, I think it's fair for somebody like a Moderna or the BioNTech, if it is about the platform, that there needs to be a return on that. Uh, for somebody like an AstraZeneca, with the funding that they have received, that that is probably less prevalent and it's maybe more being a good citizen. I don't know how that's going to shake out when these shots are available. Let's assume they all work. Like who's who's going to be able to charge and who is not going to go to be able to charge? And honestly, I, I, I don't think anybody knows at this point. Yeah, no, certainly nobody knows, but we do know the threshold there in terms of efficacy that the FDA set, which would be about 50%, that preliminary data from the earlier phase trials that you're discussing here would seem to indicate that most of these, if not all of them, would meet that threshold. But the question then becomes a cost and everything else associated to it as well. Um, we talked about this with another biotech analyst uh, last week in terms of how, as you're saying, the stock prices may have run up a little bit more beyond where the data is right now. So when you think about whether or not all of these vaccine candidates and all these biotech companies can equally split the profit,
rise here. Uh, is that really how we should be looking at it? Or will the market ultimately just choose one or two winners to go in with those vaccines and, and just kind of shed the rest? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so I think that the real crux is going to be on the seasonal side. So, so for me, the question is, if you look at Astra's vaccine, which is a, a chimpanzee-based adenovirus vector vaccine, it is possible that we get some immunity against that vector. So it may not be a seasonal candidate after all. Um, that's probably not true for Moderna and, and Pfizer-BioNTech. That, that may be a vaccine that you could give year after year after year, depending on what immunity really looks like. We, we don't have an answer to that yet either. So I think that the way the industry will make a return on this is if we can integrate that into a flu-like shot that is given every year. Um, as, as it is a pandemic, do they split it? If the data looks the same, maybe, uh, but I do suspect you'll probably see some differences in the efficacy. So when you look at the antibody response in, in the Astra vaccine, it looks pretty similar to what you have in, in recovered patients. If you look at the BioNTech data, that antibody response looks looks higher. And that's really what you want to see if you want to trigger some memory in the immune system. And obviously, there's that conundrum. Antibodies don't hang around. You may get a T cell response, but we don't really know what that means. What T cells, how broad, what effectors, loads yeah. and loads of questions. No, a lot more to learn in these phase three trials. And I think that's what's really making this quite interesting to watch as we come down the final stretch. Interesting as well to see all of these vaccines kind of targeting the same kind of binding domain and the spike protein as well. For all you biotech nerds, out there. Uh, very interesting to watch. But Michael Leuchten, uh, UBS Managing Director at Equity Research, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for having me.